you know, every time I take a few days off, there's so much going on that I can't wait to get back into it with you. You know what I mean? Yeah, I take a little break during the summertime. I did for the last three working days. And, of course, you know, last Thursday night uh, we had a, a program uh, with Cranston City Councilors regarding the continuing controversy over the state police report in the Cranston Police Department. And that will kind of headline our rundown here tonight. Of course, Ferguson had a one-year anniversary, and I can't, you know, our culture is that we, we anniversarize, to create a word, uh, stuff, events. And you're always either looking forward to the celebration or wary of the remembrance. And I think that was a little bit of the issue in Ferguson. Our guest tonight will comment on that. Ricardo Pitts Wiley is back. He's a really great thinker, and uh, he's got a reflection or two on that and a whole bunch more. So stay tuned. Good to have you in. Thanks for watching now three times per night on Meyer ITV at 7.30, 11.30, and on Fox Providence at midnight. Let's check the rundown and cover some of the things that we're talking about. Yeah, so you know that we record our program in the late afternoon daily, and it airs when you see it at 7.30, 11.30, or midnight. But at 7 o'clock tonight, the Cranston City Council was scheduled to do this, as the headline reads, Fung to face grilling over report. That would be Mayor Alan Fung. And uh, it's all regarding that state police report on the Cranston PD. And of course, last week, you know, Mayor Fung was uh, mea culpa, mea culpa, mea maxima culpa. And I'm sure some people are going to buy it. Um, so far, there are plenty of folks at Cranston City Hall who don't, including the city council president who was on my radio program on WPRO weekdays noon to three earlier today. How do you characterize something this damaging? Uh, uh, it's just, to me, it, uh, I was completely amazed. It's unbelievable uh, that the public safety director of the city of Cranston, who is Mayor Fung, had no knowledge of the workings of the Cranston Police Department. Uh, I just can't believe it. You know, so that meeting tonight, which I'm sure will be covered widely news-wise, is open to the public. It's a single issue on the agenda, this Cranston Police Report. And I guess the format is the public has a right to ask the mayor questions about it and dialogue with them, and then the council will take over their own exclusive conversation. It ought to be, well, I don't know what it's going to be, to be honest with you. Uh, I know that there's a lot of disgust and disenchantment, and one of the counselors who was, at the be was one of the beginning victims of all the sagas in this police report, that of the ticket gate scandal, Steve Stikos, kind of capsulized it last Thursday night. Every time he talks from now on, I'm going to be wondering whether he's telling the truth. And how he repairs that damage is beyond me. Uh, and that I think a lot of the citizens feel that way, and I suspect other members of the council feel that way. He, how has he run a city when he has uh, blown his credibility? People trusted him. He was elected unopposed in the last election. That's how much they trusted him. I'm pretty disgusted. I'm reminded by Jess that uh, we all agreed that we weren't going to call them victims. We were going to call them targets. Okay. He was a target, not a victim. Uh, but you know who are the victims? The citizens. Because this is such a mess. When you put your political professional career ahead of public service, well, you victimize the public. And I would think that, that at some juncture, Alan Fung ought to just say, you know what, I quit because I let everybody down. Instead, he's making all sorts of excuses as to why they were let down. Here's the key. You're either going to read this report, those of you in Cranston and beyond, or you're not. If you read the report, you'll throw up and you'll ask him to go. If you don't read the report, he won't. Next item, deal is done. Yeah, I was shocked at the reporting on the Paw Sox new management trip to Durham, North Carolina. Headline, it is a beautiful ballpark. It's so funny, you know, I was away. I actually flew into Raleigh Durham on Thursday, the day after they had this big to-do where they had dozens of people invited, but only a few could make it because plane arrangements didn't work out well. You know, movers and shakers in the community who could influence how people feel about this baseball project. Um, I was playing golf at Pinehurst, but uh, it's hot down there, FYI. Um, but Larry Lachino, the outgoing president of the Red Sox, who still is the principal guy in the new Paw Sox ownership, you know, has some things to say both on camera and off. One of our slogans is it's more than a ballpark. 
Paul Sox Chairman Larry Lucchino's vision of building a new ballpark in downtown Providence. Well, we Wednesday no night, the Paw Sox the, uh, Chairman, along with dozens of local business, community, and educational and leaders, were in Durham, North Carolina, to check out that city's AAA baseball stadium. It's very similar to the situation we have. We took Durham because it was one of the best examples, but not the only example, but one of the best where a public-private partnership came together. The mayor says it's a win-win for everyone. It's really been a catalyst for downtown revitalization. No ifs, ands, and buts about it. You know, there are differences between Durham and Providence, size, population, uh, uh, economics, all that kind of stuff, and actually the areas where the stadiums are proposed. The Durham Stadium was in a very blighted area, or revitalized a blighted area. The 195 redevelopment in Providence is an economic go zone. So, I mean, those are just the beginnings. But here's the thing that bothers me most. In the coverage, and I thank the Providence Journal for pointing this out, in the coverage over the weekend, Larry Lucchino was quoted as saying that the deal is revenue neutral now with Rhode Island, and it's more or less done. That the General Assembly leadership and the governor's people have more or less restructured the deal. Well, this is the same organization that made a public request for $130, $150 million of cash flow in their direction, and now there's a revised deal, and we're not going to hear about it until, what, five days before a public hearing, so it gets slammed, and you know what the rest of the phrase is, right through the General Assembly? This is bad government. If the deal's done, expose it. Give it a month's worth of breathing room so people can react to it. It's unbelievable. Next item. Yeah, so we still owe, I don't know, depending on the tally, 50, 60, 70, 80 million dollars, depending on uh, where your accounting goes on the 38 Studios debacle. You remember 38 Studios? There's three of the guys that just settled. 38 Studios, the wonderful deal where Kurt Schilling came in with a whole multi-online gaming idea that cost us $75 million in principal and $100 million in overall debt, including principal and interest. Here's a reminder from Eyewitness News. A proposed $12.5 million settlement announced Friday in the 38 Studios litigation, an ongoing effort to recoup as much of the $89 million in taxpayer dollars as possible tied to the belly up deal. Just four of the defendants involved in this settlement. Another law firm agreed to settle for four and a half million last year, but there is more to go with those not part of any deal, including the most recognizable face, Kurt Schilling, Wells Fargo, and First Southwest. You know, the twelve and a half million dollar settlement with those parties, including the players, including Keith Stokes, a guy who, you know, walked the floors of the General Assembly that fateful night when they stealth voted for it, didn't even know what the heck they were voting for. That twelve and a half million dollar cumulative settlement amount might take a, and shave off one annual payment that is multi years in the making still to pay off that debt. But the thing that really strikes me every time we have some development on the 38 Studios legal settlement is that we never had a hearing at the General Assembly to actually uh, give us the kind of legislative enema that we need so that something like that never happens again. And that is very much on the current speaker, Nick Mattiello, who refuses to do so. And every year that goes by is, uh, you know, rearview mirror. It's just awful. Because you know what? The cloud of 38 Studios never stops hanging over our heads. And they just don't seem to get that. Uh, the anniversary of Ferguson, WashingtonPost.com here. Yeah, you see this, you go, oh, no, not again. I don't think the nation is as focused on this story today as it certainly was last year. Hopefully, that's because it won't be as troublesome. But here was the update from the weekend. A tense scene on the streets of Ferguson, Missouri, early Tuesday morning as protesters and police clash once again. Officers arrest more than a dozen who refuse their instructions to clear the roadway. We cross the street and they tell us we can't. You know, that's the problem. The youth is hard to control. They don't listen to older guys. They don't listen to anybody that's above the age of 35. At least one officer also released pepper spray into the crowd, while some demonstrators threw bottles and other debris at authorities. You know, that conversation about young and old is an interesting one. I bet you we'll have uh, a provocative discussion with Ricardo Fitzwiley, my guest, coming up about that. Um, yeah, that's not a black, white, purple issue. That's a young and old issue. Your state of mind is important to us. 228-1886. Email me at stateofmind at myritv.com. Facebook post, tweet. Here's one. 
This is a reaction to a repeat program, I think, that we ran on Monday night, last night, correct? I just watched your show on charter schools. Dr. Gallo from Central Falls should not have been picked to be on the show, I guess, because the city of Central Falls is one big, not bit, but big charter. That's a typo. You need to interview a superintendent who really works with a town or city-funded school department. Tom. Well, that's interesting. Um, if th There's Dr. Gallo, who I think is heroic in lots of ways. You know what? I would love to have superintendents on this air to talk freely about public education. The problem is the culture of superintendents is to hide from the media. I don't know what school they taught that in, but any super that wants a seat here, any night. When we come back, Ricardo picks Wiley, the guy you should listen to. Stay with us. Yeah, so uh, the, the Ferguson situation, uh, it's kind of a rock and a hard place. You know, do you kick it back up? Do you have a conversation about it? Do you just let it go? you just let it run through the news cycle? I don't know. Here's some more reactions. Police have been abusing their power for years, years, and we want more steeper consequences for police when they, when they violate and when they do things wrong. And a police shooting left an 18-year-old critically injured. The violence prompted county officials to declare a state of emergency. You do a state of emergency in a situation where individuals are trying to uh, protest, you know, it's probably an overreaction. Meantime, businesses in Ferguson say they hope there's no repeat of the looting that happened in the wake of the Michael Brown shooting last year. Uh, Ricardo Pitzwiley is the artistic director for the Mis Mixed Magic Theater, and I'm really pleased to have him back. Good to see you. Good to be here. What, what, in, in, uh, the last time you were here, we had a we had a short but provocative conversation on TV, then a longer one on radio, about this stuff that Ferguson brought us. Now we're here a year later, and I actually didn't bring you in when we scheduled you to talk about Ferguson. You had a, a Facebook post on another conversation about Tom Brady, and you know what we're going to do? We're going to record another interview here <laughs> for the Friday show on that issue. But since the Ferguson popped this weekend, how do you think? We all want to handle this in news and social uh, circles. Oh, where should the emphasis be? Well, one of the things we have to we have to look at first is the situation that led up to Ferguson took a long time to get there. Right. And and to assume that because a year has passed that things that that things have been undone and you know is 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 not prudent thinking. Also. Knowing that a year anniversary was coming up, you would have thought that government officials, that the, the people in the, in, the, in, the, in the protest movement, would have said, you know, let's work it out. Let's work it out. Let's right. Say, let's let's do some. But at least, especially, they should have gone back to the community and said, we we know the year anniversary is coming up. What can we do to make sure that 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 we don't have a repeat? That it's that it, demonstrations are peaceful. That there's an active, that we can demonstrate there's an active dialogue going on or something like that. And I don't feel like any of that happened. And so, so, so it, it's a, it's a failure on a lot of people's part. Uh, we have a culture of marking the calendar. Yes. That's not that's not a a race issue. That's a that's an American thing. That, we do that. We we it's a it's a human thing. We right. mark the calendar. Right. So you got to know that things are going to cough back up a little bit because That's right. there's a, a whole segment of the community that doesn't feel like there's any resolve. Well, not only a whole segment of the community, but a national community that says there's nothing has been resolved. If you look at what's happened since Ferguson in that year, there are, people in Ferguson could easily look at it and say, not only has nothing changed in Ferguson, nothing has changed nationally. Baltimore. Baltimore. That's when we uh, first got together. Baltimore happened. Uh, uh, Cincinnati happened. Cleveland happened. Texas happened. Uh, I mean, on and on, these uh, these events have happened. And and uh, and Trayvon Martin has not been forgotten. And so so the, uh, it's 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 unfortunate because it's like a wall of names now. Um, one of the things that I have noticed happening, and I, and I and I saw something on TV the other night where. A policeman was saying, you know, the Justice Department came in and made it everything worse and, and bullied us around and things like that. And I'm like, you're, you're not part of the solution. You're part of the problem. 
The justice, the fact that the Justice Department had to come in at all should have told you something. And I think what they said, first of all, they didn't go after the policeman who, 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 who shot Michael Brown. They, they, they said, there's a systemic problems within this department that need to be corrected. That's not, that's not an attack necessarily. And, and there are some policemen who, have, who, are, who, who, who are part of the problem. Well, you can take that as a personal attack on you, but you know, at the end of the day, if you can show where the, what the Justice Department said was wrong, then show me that. But if you take a stance like that, then what happened in Ferguson on the streets is going to keep happening. If there's, you know, I think Baltimore has done a much better job, quite frankly, of saying, you know what, we don't want this to happen again. And we've got to find some ways to engage in more meaningful dialogue, more meaningful action, more meaningful things that, that allow us to address the, these problems. But also, being left out of the mix, even politically, is the fact that some of these communities have been in dire straits for a long, long time. And the anger that's been building up didn't start with a shooting. It started well before that. And uh, 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 if we don't find ways of giving people a reasonable opportunity to earn a decent living, to live decently, to, to, to not be dependent on the government, but to be, to be more dependent on themselves, and, 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 and uh, then you're always going to be in, in facing these type of issues. All right. Now, he, he just he, he hit a real hot spot with me, and we'll talk about it next. Stay with me. Ricardo Pitts Wiley is the artistic director of Mixed Magic Theater, and uh, be before, in fact, let's do it now so I don't let this thing get away. Uh, how's business at the theater? We're all arts organizations are struggling right now, and we're and we're struggling to keep our our head above water. There's no doubt about that. We need support. We need more support. We need more donations. We need more philanthropy, but. Our mission has not changed at all. You got a couple quick shows coming up uh, or new productions. Give me a little flavor. We'll, uh, we'll uh, talk more on Friday about it because I'm going to have them back for the Friday show. But tell me. Uh, in September, we opened a show called Day of Absence. Uh, uh, Day of Absence. Day of Absence about a small town that wakes up one day and and all the black people are gone, and 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 they have to deal with, and the white citizens have to deal with the reality that there are no black people there. And it's a, it's a it's kind of a it's called a reverse minstrel show, because all the black ha all the actors are black actors in white face, uh, and but it it is so the the issues that are raised in the show from the early sixties are as present today as they were fifty years where'd ago. Come, where'd you come up with that concept? That's fascinating. Well, it, it, I didn't write the show. Douglas Turner Ward oh, from okay. the Negro Ensemble Company. Um, wrote the show, and, and, and it was well, much produced. Uh, it was widely produced, particularly in the black community uh, in the late 60s and the 70s, even into the 80s. But when we decided to revisit it, it was because we looked at it and said, look, you know, the same issues that people were, were, were talking about 50 years ago, they're the same issues. And Douglas Turner Ward, uh, in writing the show, he said, we have to find a way to laugh at some of this stuff because the absurdity of it is so real and so painful. If we don't laugh at it, we'll do something worse. Mm. Uh, Mixed Magic Theater, located in Pawtucket. That's right. Uh, and the website is. Do we have that? Do we, do we put it up? The mix, it's mixedmagictheater.com, right? It's uh, it's uh, m m t r i dot com. M m t r i dot com. M m t. You can remember that. Mm -hmm. R i dot com. Apologize for not having it up. We'll. Uh, mm -hmm. We'll, we'll, we'll make sure that we get it up. Yeah. But the thing that you said, and there's no way we're going to finish this conversation in four minutes on television, <laughs> but you said, you know, what we really want is, is for people to have, uh, you know, an opportunity not to be dependent on government. You know what? I think America is hooked on government. And I don't know that, uh, again, this is not necessarily a racial discussion. I think America is hooked on government. We are teetering on the edge where I'm concerned that America's 
majority population, I'm talking about numbers of people, not race, mm. think that it's government's job to bail them out and help them? Well, bail them out in the same way they, the, the government bailed out the banks. Uh, who had who had done uh, the whole country and the people in the country a whole di uh, a major disservice? Yeah, sometimes they, too they big to fail out. does apply. You know. Well, well, maybe it does, but everybody's you know, got money in but, the bank. Who's who's bigger to fail? More important to not fail than the American people. Um, uh, the, you know, separating government from capitalism, the concept of capitalism. Capitalism, in my mind, is dependent on the maintenance of a permanent underclass of people. You know, we didn't have an immigrant properly, uh, problem in this country until the, the immigrants who were coming in said, we want to, to live the American dream just like everybody else. You know, uh, uh, if you maintain an underclass of people who will work for cheaper, who will, who will do the things that other people don't want to do, who will ma help make other people rich. And, and you know, what's, what's, what's terrible about that underclass of people is Capitalism deals with them as disposable. If 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 you don't want to do this work, we'll find somebody you a, else. You got a better system. Well, uh, I I think the system that we have can work better, but but it's it's really failing when people are willing to work and they get poorer. People are 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 are, are, are who want things uh, and are willing to work for them can't get them because. Because the ceiling is preventing them from 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 going any not not as high as their work ethic is, but but the economic opportunity. This is crazy. Uh, where I grew up in Detroit, I remember black communities with with middle class people yeah, sending their kids that. to college. But but that doesn't that hardly exists anymore. And and uh, uh, you know as long as you're trying to maintain, keep people in control, pay them less than a, you know, I mean, who ever heard of, well, how can one think something can work when if you work 40 hours a week, you can't earn enough not to have to w depend on food stamps, subsidies, or anything else? Why isn't it possible, possible to make it so that a person can earn a living wage? So that, so I can do things for myself, that I can take a vacation with my kids sometime. I can buy a new car every once in a while. Well, if all you're doing, not to use the old cliche, is flipping a burger for those 40 hours, I'm not so sure I feel that sorry for you. Well, but, but, okay. but so, uh, so you, know, you and I have how, how many, how many, how many college graduates who are, are flipping burgers right now because that's the job that's available Well, we've them. got some cyclical problems, there's no doubt about it with the economy, but the whole notion that uh, government is there to, to, to step in, I think has always been appropriate, but now I think it's the normal course of, 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 of behavior, and I think we've got a big problem. I, 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 I don't agree that government has sometimes overstepped, you know, but you know something? Sometimes government has to come in to protect the citizen from, from, from interests who do not have the American public's best interests at heart. They have their own best interests at heart. And, and uh, any time you have something called the 1% and the 99%, you know something? You've got a national problem. All right. Um, my guest will reappear on Friday. It gives you a reason to schedule. Thanks for joining me. All right. One more thing. Stay with me. So again, uh, I'll have Ricardo on Friday. Make a note because we've got a lot to talk about. Uh, we'll be on the radio tomorrow at noon, tomorrow on WPRO, recapping the city council event in Cranston, which is just tough stuff. Okay, so we'll see you on the radio tomorrow. I'm back here on TV tomorrow night on My State of Mind. Thanks for watching.